Hey everyone, this week we're introducing something new that we haven't really tried before. We asked Hector to go smurf like always, but this time we asked him to provide educational commentary as he plays the game. We've uploaded his full commentary smurf games exclusively to our website and we'll be continuing to upload a bunch of them on a weekly basis. Hector's also promised not to leave his desk and respond to questions you may have on these commentary releases for the first seven days upon their release, so be sure to check us out after this video. So why have we done this? Well, there's definitely a difference between analysis made after the fact and how someone actually thinks when they're playing the game. Both types of analysis are surely useful, but it may surprise you just how simple the decisions a challenger player makes can be. We'll be asking a lot of questions this time around, so see if you can think just like Hector does when he's smurfing. Let's hop right into the start of this game. The matchup Hector will be playing is Ash and Thresh versus a Lucian Blitzcrank lane. As the lane begins, what do you think Hector's game plan will be for this bot lane matchup? Let's see what he had to think. So I kind of want to be the one pushing in this lane, and a big reason for that is because there's two hook champions. Okay, that's a very easy to follow game plan based off of simple logic. There isn't a whole lot of thought process behind this. Having wave advantage lets your support land hooks. Not only that, but even if your support misses a hook here and there, your opponent will be unable to punish. They can't threaten skill shots through the big wave that you'll have to protect you if you have the shove lead. The same logic can be applied to any support matchup where both champions have a skill shot. If you deny the enemy support the chance of ever landing their skill shot, while at the same time opening up your own support to do so, it's obviously a win-win and the lane will go much smoother. That's what happened this game. Hector and his Thresh were able to consistently get good trades, until eventually they scored a solid, if somewhat sloppy, double kill. Since there's no real gameplay theme to this video, let's just skip ahead to a much later part of the game. Hector managed to snowball pretty hard, so let's hear the logic behind his current actions. So we keep pushing here. Uh, we see four of them on the map. Okay, once again, that's sound, simple logic. Reacting to the enemy team's plays around the map would be incorrect. He'd just get there too late. It's much better to cross map and look for an advantage elsewhere. The real question for this section will be what Hector's actions will be after he takes this inhibitor tower. What do you think he'll do? And you'll get bonus points if you tell us why he'll do it. All right, let's see what happens and what he thinks about it. So this is a free inhibitor. Now I will say I don't think taking this inhibitor is correct, uh, but I think my team's mental would go boom if I didn't, uh, because they don't understand why this is potentially wrong. All right, so that's a bit weird. Making a call that he thinks is incorrect to spare his team from tilting. Let's break this down. First, let's discuss why taking an inhibitor so early is usually not ideal. The problem with taking very early inhibitors is that they're only useful if you can make use of the pressure generated from the super minions. With the inhibitor down, you'll always have a man advantage for everything that you attempt to do since someone on the enemy team is obviously stuck clearing the super creeps. The problem is that having a man advantage this early into the game is not always that useful. Trying to do Baron at 20 minutes, even with a 5v4 advantage, is usually suicide. And it's not like you can just randomly push or dive mid lane towers. Towers will still be relatively powerful at this stage of the game, so it's difficult to get any meaningful advantages by grouping near a tower, especially if the enemy team has reliable wave clear. Therefore, if you take too early of an inhibitor, most of the time you're just funneling farm into someone on the enemy team. This can be quite problematic when it's a hyperscaling champion, such as Jax, for example. To illustrate just how bad it is to take early inhibitors, Let's take a look at an extreme example from recent competitive history. At the 2019 MSI semifinals, G2 willingly let their inhibitor die to minions against the best team in League of Legends history. If professional players think other professional players can't use the early inhibitor pressure, then you most definitely don't want to rely on your random gold and platinum teammates to use the pressure efficiently. Okay, so if it wasn't a good idea, then why'd he do it anyways? Well, just as he said, he doesn't want to give his team any reason to tilt. If he left that inhibitor alive, who knows what someone may have said or what it could lead to. Anytime you can afford to do something that boosts team morale, you may as well do it. But only do so if you're sure that you can win anyway. Luckily for Hector, he's obviously a smurf. He took that inhibitor because any advantage that he gives the enemy team won't matter in the long run. 
All right, let's take a look at a couple of examples from another game that Hector played. In this one, Hector has already accrued a pretty large lead, so his team plays around him setting up a solid dive. At the end of it, he places a pink ward in the lane bush and walks back to hit the tower with his team. After a bit of pushing, we arrive at the point where he makes another interesting decision. It's very clear that he has plenty of time to kill this tower and get first tower gold, especially since we see no one coming anytime soon thanks to that earlier pink. Instead, he just backs off without taking the free 600 plus gold. Why do you think he did this? There's two reasons this time, so think hard. Okay, let's listen to what he thought about it. I think I lose a lot of tempo by doing that. There's arguments to be made, because even if I take the tower, it doesn't change my back. I would still get Recurbo pickaxe. So I'm kind of just delaying my base, whereas I kind of want to get back out on the map to prevent this dragon, right? His foresight instantly pays off, as he's here in time to cut off Lux's rotation to dragon, securing a free kill, as well as ensuring that his team gets the objective easily. Now, of course, his decision was based off of the fact that he didn't need the turret gold and the dragon was up. Let's imagine some different scenarios. Imagine you're playing Lucian and you need 600 gold to finish Blade of the Rune King. In that case, you would stay to finish the tower and just relay that information to your team in hopes that they'll be patient. Huge power spikes like that are too important, and securing the necessary gold before you base would be the correct call. Now, let's imagine there wasn't a dragon up. This means that there's no rush to get back out on the map. You may as well take the free 600 or so gold. This opens you up to potentially rotating top after recalling, since you don't have to go back bottom anymore. Alright, let's take a look at another macro decision Hector makes shortly after this dragon tower situation. I would ideally like to go top lane, but Renekton is very unlikely to, to rotate, right? Something we discuss often. Even if I ping him, he's likely to just stay up here, and I do not want to share farm. Again. Pretty simple, right? This is something that we're constantly bringing up about not going to lanes that are already being farmed. With that line of thinking in mind, what do you think is the most pressing issue on Hector's mind at the moment? So I just pr I will just pressure mid and hope Ari goes bottom. If Ari comes mid, I will just go bottom. Okay, he's not even remotely thinking about the enemy team, but is instead focusing on what his own teammates may do. ADC is a unique role in that way. After a certain point, you and your support should be taking over mid, but people really love to ARAM for some reason, which usually results in you sharing farm. You need to be hyper aware of not only the enemy team's movements, but your own team's as well. In case they come to group at a bad time, you should be looking for other sources of farm that you can rotate to just in case. In this scenario, Lux had pushed in a way bottom that Ari should ideally be catching so that she can pressure the side lane but in low elo, that oftentimes won't be the case. It'll be up to you to react to your own teammate's bad macro and rotate appropriately. All right, that's going to be it for this guide. What did you think of this content type? Let us know in the comments below and smash that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. As a reminder, the full Smurf commentary games from Hector and our other experts are now live on our website, which we're now starting to roll out every week. So be sure to check us out there, along with the 800 additional guides that we have that are designed to help you escape ELO hell. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.